Welcome, welcome, folks. It is Tuesday, August the 12th, 2025. This is Hurricane Hub Live streaming on 13 News Now Plus. I am Chief Meteorologist Tim Pandate. A special shout out to our viewers on YouTube. We really appreciate you chiming in in the comment section, asking questions. We love to address them uh, during our segments that are every weekday at 8 p.m. right here on 13 News Now Plus. Tonight on HHL, it's a busy one. Of course, we've got Aaron way out there in the eastern Atlantic. And you know what? It's struggling a bit in the eastern Atlantic. Right now, it's uh, not in a very favorable environment for intensification, but it will get there as it moves farther to the west in the coming days. Shifting model trends in regard to the overall storm track. Yesterday, models were favoring a little bit of a nudge to the west. Today, a little bit of a nudge to the east, and that we are expecting to continue. Model flip-flopping with so much uncertainty in the long range. A lot of variables in play here that we're going to talk about the steering variable as we get into the upcoming weekend, what the upper level steering may look like uh, as it gets towards the uh, lesser Antilles by that point in time. And could Aaron, which will be Hurricane Aaron in a couple of days, could it be our season's first example of rapid intensification. We'll get into exactly what that means and why it's somewhat anticipated in the forecast, the intensity forecast put out from the National Hurricane Center as we get in the later part of that uh, period out by uh, Saturday into Sunday. All right, here's a look at the current imagery. We are going off the 5 o'clock advisory with the 8 o'clock intermediate advisory uh, stats here. Okay, so that's an update on its intensity and its location and its forward movement there. The 5 o'clock advisory is a full update, and we get the track update with that, and I'll show you that too in just a second. But on satellite imagery, infrared imagery here, and we use this, I like to use this because it tells us the temperatures of the cloud tops. Colder the cloud tops, the stronger the convection or thunderstorm activity surrounding the core of Aaron or any tropical system. And we can kind of see it here as we play it out over the last six hours. In fact, let's go to the last 12 hours here. And you can see that it looked pretty anemic earlier today. It was almost stripped away of all of its convection. But in the last couple of frames, notice we're starting to get into that nighttime convective burst that we saw playing out last night. It's starting to build back some of that convection. Overall, under the hood, structure is still intact. It's just the convective nature of things kind of died out because, as I mentioned when we started this video, it's a little bit of an unfavorable atmosphere. We've got dry air in place. We've got a little bit of some wind shear. Sea surface temperatures are not very uh, supportive of tropical intensification at all. They're in the upper 70s. You need 80 or warmer, but it's moving into a very favorable environment here, probably within the next 24 hours or so, and that's when we'll start to see these numbers start to climb. Uh, wind speeds will climb, and we'll start to see that pressure come back down, likely sub 1,000, probably within the next 24 hours or so, and you can see here in the last couple of frames that burst in intensification. Well, not really intensification, but at least convection returning uh, and forming around the core. Now, switching things up and looking at visible satellite Imagery. As I mentioned, the structure is still pretty sound. You can see definitely an evident spin here. You can see that uh, well-defined core uh, with Aaron, but off lurking to the north and west, you can see kind of that stable air. You've got a stable cumulus deck here well to the north and west, and that is indicating the dry air in the mid-levels of the atmosphere. Not much lifting mechanisms going on out there. We've got the Saharan dust. The rust color here is relative humidity in the mid-levels of the atmosphere that's just too dry to support any sort of tropical moisture. And some of that dry air has been injecting itself uh, into air in here, wrapping around its uh, overall circulation. But, uh, you know, eventually we'll see that drier air retreat and this take a little bit of a dive to the west southwest uh, in the coming day. So here's the track that came out at five o'clock. Again, we'll get these updates at five o'clock, 11 o'clock and then 11 a.m. and 5 a.m. Uh, in terms of track updates. And in between those every three hours, you get the intermediates. So this is the five o'clock track change. And honestly, since they uh, named this storm yesterday at 11 a.m., there hasn't been many large changes to the overall forecast track here. It's really after we get past the next five days, which is how far the NHC track goes out, we start to see some big changes with variations in terms of what models think may happen. And that really kind of plays into the overall steering that I'm going to get to. I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get to that in just a couple minutes. So here's the track. Without further ado, again, 50 mile per hour tropical storm by tomorrow afternoon. But by Thursday night into early Friday, we should have ourselves Hurricane Aaron first of the season. And then by uh, Sunday afternoon, we should be up to a category three major hurricane here just to the north 
of Puerto Rico. And I talked about not many big changes with the forecast track. There have been some subtle changes, like a subtle drop here to the west-southwest with the cone. So now that cone does clip the British Virgin Islands over to Anguilla, Anguilla and uh, Barbuda, and even clips the northern coast of Puerto Rico there. It doesn't mean that Aaron's going to hit there, uh, but the possibilities there, as we get farther out, notice how the cone gets bigger and certainly gets larger uh, the farther out in time you go. So it's a possibility here, but mostly favoring probably the northern end of the cone, I'd say, as we get to that point. But could be a Category 3 major hurricane uh, out at this point of Sunday afternoon. Now, I talked about after that how uncertain things get. And you can see here, even by like day three, we're seeing a lot of ensemble members, which is each white line here is a, a run of either the GFS, Canadian or Euro. They run ensemble members, which is the same model run several different times, dozens of times in some cases. And they tweak the initialization, changing a variable slightly to see if we get a different outcome. So that's why there's such a large spread here. But even by like day two and three, you notice a lot of these uh, ensemble members are coming outside of the cone. And certainly after you get past five days, you see a spread here from the Bahamas to well east of Bermuda. And you'll notice here a general trend is that a turn to the west northwest and then a turn due north and then northeast is heavily favored by almost every single model. Are there some outliers? Yes, there always will be. Like you see, there's definitely a cluster of storms or a cluster of ensemble members here that take it much farther to the west closer to the U.S. East Coast, but the majority of which have been trending farther to the east. Still possibility of impacts to land like Bermuda, but to the U.S. East Coast, it would likely be indirect impacts, coastal erosion, rip currents, heavy surf. Could see some 10, 15 foot swells if we get a Category 3 major hurricane moving up parallel to the eastern seaboard. So that could be some indirect threats there. But in terms of a landfalling system, can I completely rule it out? Absolutely not. But as of right now, with our data in hand, it's looking more likely like a turn to the north and then northeast staying out to see OTS. Now, some of you may look at that and say, that's a fish storm. No. It did impact land. The Cabo Verde Islands, when this moved over, it, just before it formed, it actually killed half a dozen people from the flooding there. So it's already claimed lives. Even if it stays out over open water for the remainder of its life cycle, it already did claim lives. So it's already been a deadly storm. And then it may even focus on Bermuda here as we get into the um, seven to nine day time frame or probably like seven day time frame. All right. I mentioned how the sea surface temperatures are just not conducive at all for where Aaron is right now. Uh, look at where it's been tracking its entire life cycle. It's been almost a miracle that it became a tropical storm in these cool waters and with the dry air in place and with the wind shear initially. So it overcame all those odds and we still have tropical storm Aaron here. And it's not just barely a tropical storm. You need 39 mile per hour winds or greater. It's at 45. Yeah, it stayed there for the last 24 hours or so, but it is expected to intensify as it's moving in. Everything that's shaded in red here is sea surface temperatures of at least 80 degrees or warmer. So it's just about there. And once it starts to get into that favorable sea surface temperature environment, moist uh, mid-levels of the atmosphere, reduced wind shear, things like that, we'll definitely start to see this thing blossom. And it's only going to get warmer, more fuel, and not just warmer on the skin of the ocean surface. This is deep warm water. And as we get an intensifying, Aaron, upwelling starts to occur. You get all the winds out there in the open ocean, it starts to mix it all up, something called upwelling. Now, when you've got warm waters just on the skin, you're going to mix up cooler waters from a depth and kind of deplete that warm reserve. The energy will be gone. When you've got warm, deep water, the upwelling will do its thing, mixing it on up. But if it extends down 100, 150 meters down the warm water, you're going to see that warm water just continuously be replaced replaced and replenished. Uh, so that's going to help to it increase the intensification odds of Aaron as we go out into the upcoming weekend. This is the cone, by the way. It goes all the way out to uh, Sunday afternoon and puts it into some really, really warm ocean waters. In fact, this part of the southwest Atlantic is undergoing a marine heat wave. I'm sure you've heard that before. We've got extremely warm temperatures, not only in the water, but in the air uh, sitting over the Atlantic there. And that's just cooking up the ocean waters and making it ripe for rapid intensification, possibly, but overall intensification of tropical systems that move through that part of the ocean. All right, now let's compare the models. We'll look at the operational models runs of the European, 
and the GFS. What I showed you on the spaghetti plots were the ensemble members of those models. So we're going to look at this, the averages pretty much of all of these. We'll play it out here going through the rest of the week. Not much. It's not picking up on anything. I have it kind of set up to start showing up when it becomes a hurricane. Uh, and we're there by this weekend. So notice both the GFS, the European in the red, the GFS in the yellow. By this weekend, relatively good agreement here on model location and intensity. GFS is a little bit smaller and tighter. Still hurricanes here at this point in time. There's San Juan, Puerto Rico. You know, your British Virgin Islands are right here on the southern fringe of where the European uh, has it. But let's jump out a few more days. So we've got that turn to the northwest, and then the GFS goes off to the races and turns north much earlier than what the European is showing here, which is a change from yesterday. If you remember this model, the GFS, this was pretty much right here. So that's a big jump to the east in the last 24 hours. So this is the 18Z run. We were showing the 18Z yesterday as well. So a 24-hour spread of the GFS model. Is it right? Too early to tell. Maybe tomorrow when we join, it'll be back over here. But right now, the GFS is, there's Bermuda, is now even east of Bermuda. European model still coming in between to the west of Bermuda and to the east of the U.S. East Coast. Both showing major hurricanes here. But just very different locations. Timing looks pretty good by the middle of next week. So we're over week, we're eight days out still. Pretty good timing there. And then they both shoot up to the north. You've got the GFS that's uh, heading even south of Nova Scotia, or southeast of Nova Scotia. And you still have the euro that's a little bit slower uh, behind by next Wednesday, the 20th, uh, still hanging out here just to the north of Bermuda by that point. Regardless, we're still in the time frame here of over a week out. If it were to be any threat to the U.S., and as I showed you, unlikely directly to be a threat. Indirectly, yeah, we'll see the rip currents. We'll see the coastal erosion. We'll see the big surf. Uh, likely for several days next week as it's passing by offshore, if that is indeed how it plays out. But we're just about to enter that window here of 8 to 10 days, more like 9 to 10 uh, probably right now based on its current location. And I, I forgot to mention this. You may have seen on the advisory the speed, the movement of Aaron is quite fast. Moving to the west at 22 miles an hour. Now, usually the average speed of a tropical system in the Atlantic Basin is between 10 and 15 miles per hour. So it's moving quick. Between yesterday and today when, we, when we're talking, it's covered already over 250 miles. So it's cruising along, and it's going to cover a lot of ground in a short amount of time. Now let's get to the steering of what's going to be guiding Aaron to the north, kind of a departure from its pretty much due west trajectory up until that point. That point in time will likely come on Sunday into Monday. This is when we already have a major hurricane at that point, Category 3, okay? We're looking at the, the depiction here of the upper-level steering patterns, the pressure patterns, on Sunday evening. Now, what's going to be steering Aaron to the west for, until that's time, is a sprawling Bermuda High or Azores High or subtropical ridge. And that's keeping it kind of pressed down to the south and moving along the southern periphery of that ridge pushing it due west. Now in time, by Sunday, how models see things going is that ridge beginning to break down and almost separate into two peaks. We'll have a ridge of high pressure sitting over the eastern U.S. and we'll have the remnants of that Bermuda High still parked off to the east. In between, weakness or a trough of low pressure dipping in from the north and west. And what that will do, it'll dip down and Aaron will sense it and it'll begin to pull it to the north. So it's almost like an escape route that it's going to move in between, thread the needle between these two ridges and move along this trough of low pressure. That'll pick it up and then turn it off to the north and east away from the U.S. eastern seaboard. As it looks right now, this is the pressure pattern Sunday evening that'll start to turn it to the north. Could this change? Sure. This is the GFS solution. The European isn't as pronounced of a breakdown of the ridge, but still does have a breakdown or a weakening of it. So we'll see how things play out there. But that is a huge variable. And if it breaks down sooner, that turn north will happen sooner. If it happens later or the ridge doesn't break down at all, we're talking more of a U.S. threat, which doesn't look likely right now. All right. We talked about the rapid intensification possibility. Now, we're not going to get there for days because you see the intensity forecast here for Aaron keeps it as a minimal grade tropical storm through tomorrow, through much of Thursday, but it's starting to intensify. And by Thursday night, we're already at 70 mile per hour winds, high end tropical storm, almost a Cat 1 hurricane. But between Thursday night and Friday night, we see a big jump in intensity. Could we go from 70 mile per hour winds to 100 mile per hour winds? This is the base intensity forecast. 
could overperform here. And why I say that, if it does overperform, we would have an instance of rapid intensification here because the definition of rapid intensification, according to the Hurricane Center, is when a hurricane's maximum sustained winds, which you saw there Thursday night at 70 miles per hour, and by Friday night, we're up to 100 miles per hour. If it increases by at least 30 knots or 35 miles per hour within a 24-hour period, that would satisfy the definition for rapid intensification. Now, we don't have that here. We don't have 35 miles per hour. But if it overachieves and intensifies quicker, we could have ourselves an instance of rapid intensification later this week for Aaron as it becomes a Category 1 and then Category 2 and eventually a Category 3 is what it's forecast to to peak at. I mean, it may even peak stronger than that. This only goes out for five days, so past Sunday it may be stronger as it's beginning to build on off towards the north. So Aaron Storm Analogs, we visited this yesterday, and I, pl I plotted in the uh, current location of where Aaron is, and I expanded it. Yesterday we were looking at within 50 miles of its current location. Today I upped it to 150, and we get a whole lot larger of a storm sampling here. We're up to 79 storms that have tracked within 150 miles from Aaron's current location. Now, of those 79, only eight have made landfall in the U.S., but boy, when they did, they left a mark. These are some of the notable landfalls of this threshold of 79. Ike, 2008, that's the farthest west one. So we went up to the Houston area. Isabel, many folks on the eastern seaboard remember that one for sure in 2003. Irma, recently. Florence, very recently, 2018, uh, eastern North Carolina was just wrecked. And then France is back in 2004, and there are others that were way earlier than that, but uh, probably outside of memory. Uh, for most, but most of which passed out to sea, which is what's favored at this point for the track of Aaron. So bottom line, as we wrap things up here tonight, folks, we, we expect continued shifts in model guidance. As we started off today or yesterday, remember there was a, a trend to the west. Today, that trend is to the east. We're going to flip-flop a couple more times probably before confidence really starts to grow that it's going to be a definite turn to the north or not. Now, recurving out to sea is most likely and is most favored at this point, as I mentioned. But the indirect impacts are still likely. Heavy surf, beach erosion, rip current risk. Rip currents have been wreaking havoc along the eastern seaboard so far this summer. When you get a big storm off the coastline, yeah, you're going to see it uh, playing out for several more days. Now, when it does make the turn to the north, that will be key in writing off a U.S. threat at all. And when that turn north happens will be when that ridge, as I showed you, when it breaks down. Now, I want to leave you with one more area that just got outlooked by the National Hurricane Center. And while everybody's been focused on Aaron, there's been this tropical wave that's been festering in the far western portions of the Caribbean, building up towards the Yucatan. Looks pretty healthy. It's going to pass over the Yucatan and then redevelop or reemerge, I should say, in the southern Gulf in the Bay of Campeche. This area is notorious for helping to spin up tropical activity just because of its ge geographic nature. With that curvature of the southern portion of the Bay of Campeche, it already initiates some spin. So when you get a wave that's already pretty robust building into that area, I wouldn't doubt if we get Fernand coming out of the Bay of Campeche in the next seven days or so while we're tracking Aaron. So it's not the only show in town. All right, yesterday's trivia question. Only once on record have two hurricanes made landfall on Bermuda in the same year. What was that? Was it last year? Was it in 2020, the busiest season on record, 2014 or 1999? Yeah, that was in 2014. And it happened within one week, two hurricanes making landfall on Bermuda. Remember, landfall is categorized as the center of the eye wall passing over land. And that happened. I mean, it's like threading a needle. Bermuda is a very tiny island in a very large Atlantic Ocean. And doing it twice in one week, in one season, is something. Faye, I believe, was a Cat 1. Gonzalo was a Cat 4 at its peak. I don't, I don't remember exactly what it was as it passed over Bermuda. But two hurricanes in one season there. Now you know. All right, here's tonight's tropical trivia question. Which hurricane was the first to have its name retired. Whew, this is going to be a good one. Was it Hazel, Carol, Diane, or Audrey? I'll have the answer for you tomorrow night on HHL. In the meantime, scan the QR code to download the 13 News Now Hurricane Guide. It is information on supplies you should have and also some numbers you may need to know. Also, a reminder, again, we are here every night 
for Hurricane Hub Live Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. We'll see you back here tomorrow.